Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahajai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda Ji, Saints of all religions, we lay the flowers of our devotion humbly at thy feet. Bless us that we able to be be able to share thy love with all. Om Shanti. Amen. People have asked me, I'm supposed to ask questions. I will need translation from your English into my understanding of English. So Dhyani, you can come up here. I'm not saying your accents are not right. Mine is probably not right. But uh, I'm very hard of hearing. So I have a few questions that have been written down. This is a natural. There's a certain attachment we have developed with the temple and the vibrations it here at B10 by 8. As we move to the new community center, how do we carry and build the vibrations of the new place and at the same time not be attached to the physical temple at B10 by 8? Well, we should not be attached to anything. So we just have to bless this place and hope that the new owners, if ever anybody else comes here, um, feels our blessings. In the new place, we have to come very often and meditate deeply, and that will build the vibrations. One could develop pride on the spiritual path and think that he or she is better than those not on any particular spiritual path. How can we avoid such ego to develop in us as we are all part of one God. What I have found is that people are often very proud of their own path, their own guru, uh, their own particular beliefs. This is one of the curses of the spiritual path, which is supposed to free us from ego. And then people get this kind of ego. I always tell people, I'm not trying to convert you to anything except your own higher self. Don't feel that in your soul you belong to anything. You have your own soul to develop. So don't worry about other people. There are other people, you're on a, ra you're on a race. Some people are ahead of you, some people are behind you. You're on the highway and you're in a car and you work hard to get ahead of one group of cars, suddenly you find yourself behind the next group. It's a never-ending thing, forget it. The, we, our guru is a great soul, a great saint, a great avatar. But he's not the only avatar, and he says it's not the only way. I think that it should be this way, that you shop the counter and f figure which piece you like best and then pick that up. You, if you don't feel in your heart, as I felt in my heart from the very beginning, this was my guru. And it just didn't matter to me whether somebody else was better or not. Um, he's mine. So if you feel that, you don't have any problem. If you do, then you go elsewhere, try. Try everything, find what's best. I'm not trying to hold you to this way, and I don't think any of us should. I think we should all realize that there are many ways and as Ramakrishna said, everybody likes sweetness, but some like it in the form of jalebi, some in the form of chocolate, etc. And so that sweetness can come in many forms. No form is better than any other. Just one is right for you. That's what I feel. So many, some saints in India have used to try to get me as their disciple. I just, uh, 
uh, I refused to pay any attention because I knew where my heart belonged. Please shed some light on how we at Ananda can help the poor people in India. You know, there's just one, you can't have every mission. We have to accept that ours is a particular mission. We're not a social charity organization. It, can, it could sap all our energy if we went that direction. There are plenty of social charities. We are here to help people to understand Sanatana Dharma. We're here to help Indians understand Sanatana Dharma. Master taught us that religion in a new and fresh way. But the religion of the universe cannot but be Sanatana Dharma. In the most distant planet, in the most distant galaxy, it would have to be that same religion, which is that everything has come from God and everything must go back to God. And our whole goal must be to go back to God. Any religion that tells us that we should find something short of that is not a true religion. But he, my guru, came to show that the true Christianity and the original Christianity, the original yoga of Krishna, are the same thing. And both are, have only one purpose, not to bring you to church, not to bring you to this ashram, to bring you to God. That's the whole purpose of it all. Sanatan Dharma has nothing to do with Ganesha, Indra, Shiva, and all those things. It has to do with reuniting our souls with God. People have said, why is there idol worship in India? The answer to that question is there is not idol worship in India. There is ideal worship, which is very different. We worship an ideal, and it's very good to have different forms to remind us of those ideals. But Indra, uh, well, Indra may be a reality. I think he probably is. But Shiva, for example, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, these are all actually aspects of Om. They don't have forms. Om is the cosmic vibration, the, tri the trinity of Om Tat Sat. In Christianity, they call it God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Three in one and one in three. And uh, Sat is the spirit beyond creation. Om is when that spirit decides to take form. It can only produce form out of vibration. God didn't have anything to create this universe out of. He only could vibrate a certain amount of his, a certain superficial part of his consciousness into the forms that finally we see around us, our pillow that we're sitting on, the walls, our bodies, everything is all vibration. And uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are the three aspects of Om. The first aspect is um, the Brahma, which is a higher vibration. You know when you hear a motorcycle start, it goes oh, 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 like that. Then when it reaches its speed, and then it reach, when it stops, <laughs> and so it is that with the triune Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, what you find is that there is first a higher vibration, that's Brahma. I remember one day, many years ago, I was meditating, it was Sri Yukteswar's birthday, I was first working all day, and I wanted very much to meditate on him in the evening, but I had to work hard and I was very tired. And when I sat for meditation, it was very difficult to keep my mind alive. And I said to Sri Yukteswar, please bless me at least when I go to sleep because I want something from you. And suddenly I was awakened from sleep and I heard this high vibration, then a lower one, and a still lower one. This is why we chant the tri triune Om. Om, Om, Om. And the first is a strong thing to get it started. Then comes Vishnu, which is preserving it, keeping the speed. And then comes the lower one, which in uh, the end of a, of a 
kalpa, the end of an age, uh, everything is dissolved back into God. And at that time, there will be, everything is a different vibration. It just shatters everything and moves everything back into spirit again. And uh, if you haven't reached liberation at that point, then you will have to go into a quiescent state and come out again, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, I throw myself into creation with the day of Brahma. And a very wonderful scripture, which I would like all of you to read, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Yogananda, it sounds, seems like just a love song, a love poem, it's not. My Yogananda suddenly saw the meaning behind it. It's a very deep meaning. You know, it was very interesting too. I was lecturing in Australia, I think it was Sydney, Australia once, and somebody said, but this particular quatrain, Rubai, doesn't seem to fit the, the uh, his, uh, Yogananda's interpretation, doesn't seem to fit the Persian words, according to uh, uh, the translation of Edward Fitzgerald. And I said, well, I had found always that when I went deeper into it, that it did fit. But it was a difficult, it was a stretch in this case. At that moment, somebody, a woman raised her hand. She said, I'm Persian, I'm from Iran. And I know this, I know this particular sloka in the original Persian. And he says, it's not exactly the same as the translation of, Sir, of Edwin, Edward Fitzgerald. But it's exactly the same as the Tur Turk as the um, uh, Persian one. So how did Master know the Persian? He knew the meaning. It was intuitive on his part. He didn't know Persian, but he knew it exactly in his meditation. Anyway, the uh, that scripture I wrote. Uh, he wrote a commentary. I edited it, and it's been published in India. It's not an Islamic book. The Islams, generally speaking, do not like the Sufis because they're too mystical. But it's a true scripture, and I do recommend it because it's a beautiful one. Anyway, in that one, he says that I've, my, many people come out who, are, who came out with the beginning of a day of Brahma are still wandering at the end of a day of Brahma. I think how many millions of years that means. And it makes you wonder, well, how many days of Brahma have we been around? It takes five to eight million lives just to evolve up to the human level. And that's not very much when you reach the human level. Unfortunately, there, there you have free will, fortunately and unfortunately. When you have free will, you can go up or down, and you can make mistakes, and you can have endless desires. And if this girl won't do you, that one might do, and this other one might do, and this boy doesn't suit you. There are millions of other boys, and so desires can be just endless. Sex desire is the strongest of all, and the, of the main delusions, the one most difficult to overcome, because Desire for money is external. It's something fed to us, sort of. Same with desire for alcohol, but sex is bred into the body, and it takes a lot of effort to free yourself from that. So I mentioned boys and girls as the major delusion, but it is a delusion. All people are the same. There's no need to feel that you need a girl or you need a boy. It's only because of this delusion that God implanted in ourselves in order to keep the world populated. If it weren't for sex, there wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't be any people. And it's got to be made attractive, otherwise who would indulge in such a thing? And so it is that this Maya keeps on and on and on. But it's mainly from sex delusion that everything happens. So if you want to overcome Maya, Work hardest on that one. Try to understand that the reality is bliss, and that bliss is here, not here. And so you have to go upward, not downward, if you want God. Well, I'm not going to go into that one at length, 
But the fact is that uh, we're here to teach that. We're here to teach Sanatana Dharma in the highest sense. Because in Hinduism, they've come a long way downhill from understanding what the real purpose of Sanatana Dharma is. To unite your soul with God, to become perfect, to get rid of all delusions and of the people in this world. Krishna says, out of a thousand, one seeks me. Well, you look around at people in the streets and you realize he had to be right. Very few people want God. One time somebody said to Master, Sir, I don't think I have very good karma. He said, remember this. It takes very, very, very good karma even to want to know God. So you are greatly blessed. You've come a long way to be here, to want that truth. Don't spend your time wasting it with ego and little desires and so on. Now that you're here, seek him seriously. Because there are many ups and downs, even after wanting God. I said to Master, because Norman, a brother disciple of mine, had seen a, a vision of himself with Master on the, on, in Lemuria. Well, if Lemuria existed, which we don't know for sure, it's supposed to have been about 80,000 years ago. And I thought, my God, and I said to Master, have I been your disciple for thousands of years? He said, it's been a long time, that's all I'll say. I didn't want to think I was the only lazy fellow on the block, so I said, well, does it always take that long? He said, oh yes. Desires for name and fame take them away again and again. So remember, don't let any desire. I think he mentioned name and fame because that was my delusion. Otherwise, why have I had to become famous in this life? I wanted to be a hermit. And he told me I have to get out there and serve people. Why? I think it must be also my samskara. I don't want fame now. I'd be happy to hide away in a cave. But I've dedicated my life to his service. And that service means partly being with you all and being famous and all those things I don't want at all. But I suppose I must have wanted them at one time. At any rate, he said that desires for name and fame, he said that to me, to for you, he might have said other things. But uh, we have to overcome all of this in order to find him. He said to me, God won't come to you until the end of life. Death itself is the final sacrifice you have to make. And I thought, sacrifice? Does he mean I'll be martyred at the end? Doesn't matter to me, but who knows? I remember I had a very interesting dream some years ago. I dreamed that enemies of mine were burning me at the stake. And I was there with the fire lighted and smoke coming up around me. And I saw them, as can happen in dreams, they were seated at a banquet table near to me, feasting and laughing and having a good time. And I didn't care at all. I thought, well, the pain will be there, but it won't be temporary. It won't be permanent. It'll soon be over, and then I won't be able to feel any pain. And then suddenly some brains came and they saved me. And I was equally indifferent. I woke up then, I thought, well, that's nice that I could be indifferent to pain to that extent. But we should realize that everything in this world is just maya. Nothing is real. So if I'm martyred, it doesn't matter. And if, if martyrdom means, as others have suggested, that you won't be able to die as soon as you'd like to, because he still has work to do, well, I accept that too. But I have to admit that is a kind of martyrdom. My family have all died at the age of 84. Here I am, 86. <laughs> but I'm happy to do it if I can serve my guru. And, uh, but I'm not afraid of death. I live, welcome it. But the thought of serving my guru and making him known in his own country and making him appreciated because he had a great mission. Sanatan Dharma needs to be brought back into its pristine purity as it was. And uh, I know there's somebody who's making a big stink on the internet and so on about 
Anand, about SRF and SR and YSS not teaching the true teachings of Hinduism. Americans can't be true Hindus. This is all sectarianism. We have to rise above sectarianism and realize that God is everywhere. And uh, the lowliest ant could realize God if he had the ability. But whether you're American or Hindu or Indian or anything, it doesn't matter. You are a child of God. And I hope that we can do some work toward that in, in, in this visit to India, which I may be able to extend later and come back here for a longer time. But I'm hoping very much to help people recognize how great his teachings were. There have been two great masters in recent times who have brought these teachings back again, Ramakrishna and uh, Yogananda. And we must be grateful to both of them. But if you feel you have another guru, it doesn't matter. Sectarianism is not the, is not the truth. God is in you. So let me try to answer a few other questions. My question to Swami Kriyananda refers to the talk he gave on October 7th. In the past, both he and Master have spoken of a coming economic depression, but this is the first time, as far as I know, that he gave a specific time. He said 2003. Actually, he said 1913, but that was just a slip, yes, of course. I'm mentioning this. In mentioning this, he said that we need to build more cooperative communities and return to the land so we can grow our own food. My, my question is this. Can we get more insight into what will have caused this depression? And is there anything we can do to prevent it? The depression will be caused purely and simply by greed. Avarice. People want money. And there, I, I had, I sold um, the house we had, Guru Kripa, and I had to be in the government office to s sign the papers and so on. And you should have heard the noise there. Everybody shouting, showing their greed for land, greed for money, greed for possessions. It was just painful to be there. I couldn't wait to get out. But this greed is unfortunately very strong and America has this is the main reason I, I mentioned 2013 America has decided to print 500 billion dollars a month now what's that going to do to the dollar master said that someday the dollar will not be worth the paper it's printed on twice in the last century uh, three times there has, there has been a, a great hyperinflation. First was in Germany, where they were printing money so fast that in the morning you could get two sausages with a certain number of billions of, of uh, franc or marks. In the afternoon you needed twice that number to get, one, to get two sausages. In um, <clears throat> somebody who uh, bought a, brought, uh, got his paycheck in a wheelbarrow. He carried this wheelbarrow to a shop that he went into. He thought, well, nobody's going to worry about this money. It's worthless anyway. So he left the wheelbarrow outside and went into the shop. When he found, came out, he found that the, the paper money was drifting all over the street. Somebody had stolen his wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to understand that this hyperinflation, it's happened in Argentina, it's happened in one other country that I forget now, but it's going to happen this time, it'll be worldwide. America with its dollar, Europe has also decided to print money. It's a great solution to depression, but uh, when you've inflated the dollar and the, worth is, the dollar itself is worth nothing, what can you do? It's bound to in infect India too. and. Uh, I think that India is inflating also. It, you can't avoid this sort of thing. It becomes worldwide. But it'll be worst, I think, in America. And uh, as my guru said, it will be much, 
worse than the 1930s. So, what is the answer? You can own gold. Gold has the same value no matter what, what the currency is. Or you can get land. Land is the best possible thing. And the best thing of all would be that we've already bought land. Help us with our community in Pune, near Pune. Because there we already have water, we have land, we can grow food. All you need to do is build a kutir there. And we can house many people. I would urge you to think of getting a kutir there and uh, coming to live with us. However, I will have to say that we don't accept everybody. They have to be people who are willing to abide by certain rules. They have to be in harmony with what we're doing. They have to understand the first principle, that people are more important than anything. We have their our first concern, their needs. We don't like any need of the community and so on to take precedence over that. If there's a job that needs to be done and nobody is ready to do it, we say the job is less important, forget it. People are more important than things, princ not principles, but possessions and all that. The next rule is jata, yata dharma stata jaya. Where there is dharma, there is victory. We had a, f a fire that destroyed most of our land in 1976. 21 of our 20, uh, 20 of our 21 homes in that area. And uh, we found that the fire was caused by a government vehicle. A faulty spark arrestor started it. Our neighbors were all excited. They said we can sue the county and get all the money back that we lost. And they didn't have to sue the county. The mere threat of a suit made the county settle. But I said I will not take advantage of our neighbors, which means the county. So I refused to, I refused to sue. And uh, another time, and another thing also with that was many people lost their homes, and, and I mean in losing their homes, lost their desire to live at Ananda. When we got donations from people to help us rebuild, the first money we gave was to those people who were leaving Ananda. After that, then we used that money to build our own homes. But we have been rigidly dynamic. There was one man I think I mentioned in my talk in 1969, I, I had to work very hard to start the community. I remember one night, I, I was so exhausted. I came to my parents' house, I had a class nearby, and Mother said, you mustn't punish yourself like this. And I said, well, I, I have no choice. I can't tell people not to come to the class. I don't know where they are. And so I went to my room and just lay down. And instead of sleeping, I thought of all the things in my life that I was trying, was, that were making me tired. Phone calls all the time, letters to write, every night a different, in the, every night in the week a different class in a different city, and so on and so forth. And each time I, I found a wave of consciousness, oh, not that, not that. And I said, well, you have to do it, accept it. So the energy I was using to push that door closed came back to me. After a half hour, I came out, and my mother said, oh, you've had such a good rest. I hadn't had a rest at all. But I was finally, what makes you tired is the thought of tiredness. My class that evening was on energization, and it was perhaps the best class I've ever given on that subject. So remember, you are a child of God. You have all the energy. It's you yourself who make yourself tired. But in starting a community, we've had to accept that they're difficult things. We don't want people to come and put their feet up on a hassock and lie back. It will take work. We need people who are willing to work. It will take no drink. I notice that drinking is very popular in India. No, uh, no alcohol of any kinds, no drugs of any kinds. But those are very few rules, and I hope that nobody in this room has problems with them. After that, if you can get along with, your, with other people, you're welcome. 
please come. We need people to build that, that community. And uh, uh, I'll be going there in a very short time and spending most of my time in India there and then going from there to different places. Now then, in your book, The Hindu Way of Awakening, you have explained in a long footnote that when one is meditating, the rotating spiral should be only should only be counterclockwise since a clockwise spiral would indicate anyway, I have to say I looked it up. I'm completely wrong. This is the direction you find, and that's if you look downwards it's clockwise. If you look upwards in the spiritual light it's clock counterclockwise. But I have to rewrite that. Thank you for calling it to my attention. What happened also was this, that uh, the editor, the main editor in SRF, Tara Mater, her name was, she told me as if authoritatively that the Nazi swastika was going in the wrong direction. And so when you have those, you know, like this, I took it as a wheel turning uh, this way. You know, when you see a wheel turning rapidly, it can leave sort of impression behind it. So I took that it meant that way, but obviously it means turning toward the turn, turn and not, anyway, I don't know how to, <laughs> I'm trying. But thank you very much for calling it to my attention. I must try to change that. Dear Swamiji, what is your vision for Ananda's future in India? I would like to see for one thing, villages, cooperative communities where people live together. You know, it's very difficult when you're living in an, thank you very much, when you're living in an environment where people are very worldly, very self-involved, very difficult to come out of that consciousness. You begin to feel that you've done your duty if you help a little old lady across the street. There's much more than that to being dharmic. And if you live among dharmic people, environment is stronger than willpower. And when you live among people who are not dharmic, it's very hard to be really dharmic, very hard to avoid the things. It's also their thoughts. It's not just their, their actions, their, their, uh, the example they said. You know, I, I was in Switzerland many years ago when I was learning Italian. And in German Switzerland, somebody asked me a question about Italian. I said, we're here in German Switzerland where everybody around us is thinking in Germany, in German. Let's wait till we get to Lugano, then I'll know. And sure enough, as soon as I got to Lugano, I had the answer. Because in German Switzerland, everybody around me was thinking German. In, Itali in Italian Switzerland, everybody around me was thinking in Italian. So it was much easier to learn. Thoughts have power, thoughts are, are influential. And where you live has a very strong influence on your consciousness. You have to be very strong spiritually, not to be affected by it, at least to some extent. Therefore, my, my vision for India's future is that this thing in Pune be only the beginning. We need villages everywhere that are dharmic like ancient India and the little villages in that yuga. If we can, be, if we can set, create one community, it will set an example to other people. And it won't happen in my lifetime, but it may happen in yours. Yogananda said that this idea of world brotherhood colonies, as he called them, spiritual villages, will spread like wildfire. I would like to see all of you take seriously my words. Because what will you do if you don't have a job? What will you do if, um, you know, as I said, this depression will be much worse than the last. People will be starving. What will you do? When you have people, trucks bringing food into the inner cities and they can't get in for the rioting moms on the outside of the cities, keeping those trucks from going in, you know, only three or four years ago in Detroit, in America, they were having a big trouble 
in the auto industry. And when trucks came into the inner cities with food, they had to have two men with guns on each side to protect them so that they could get into the inner city. This is no joke. Delhi is not a city of gardens. You need to be where you can grow your own food. You need to be where you can live closer to nature, really, but that's secondary to being, being able at least to eat. So my vision for Ananda's future in India is that we be instrumental in starting these communities all over. I would like to see them, but I think that to start a community, I have to tell you, it was very difficult in the beginning to start Ananda. When you do a new thing, I had, I had only to open my mouth for just about 10 people to want to leap into it. Everything I said, they didn't want. And now that I have it, we don't have that problem. We're able to say to new people, this is how we do things, and they accept it or don't accept it. If they don't accept it, they leave. But when they were trying to create that image themselves, there was all that trouble. I won't even bother to tell you all the trouble I had, but I don't think many people could have survived it. Now that we have it, we have a model. I think that when we create a model in Pune, it will be much easier for other people to say, this, to say we're following the Ananda system and start it that way. Therefore, I say, let's begin in Pune. And then, if you want to, you can go to start other communities, or others can come and learn how we do it and say we're a part of the Ananda system. And in these ways, um, I think that will spread across the country. The other thing is that we're here to bring back Sanatan Dharma. People think we're trying to Christianize India, not at all. Jesus Christ came to India. His teachings that he got, that he spread, that he taught, were the teachings of Sanatan Dharma. You know, the three wise men who came to him in, when he was in the cradle, they were the masters of our present path. Babaji Lahiri Mahashai Sri Yukteswar. My guru told me that after I'd been with him only one month, I was stunned. But he went back to India to learn from them. This is a very hidden part of the Bible. They have 18 years of his life completely wiped out. From the age of 12, when he's talking to the priests in the temple and they're learning from him, to the age of 30, when he came back and started preaching, people have assumed he was just a carpenter. No, they cut out that part of the Bible. Um, the Bhaga, Bharati Krishna Tirti, the Jagad Guru, uh, of uh, Purimat, I forget the name, Govardhanmat. He said to me that he had seen a manuscript of the third century discussing just that particular conclave when they decided to get rid of the 18 years. They said, but people will lose faith if they find that Jesus was taught by other people. And Somebody in the audience stood up and said, but it seems to me that if the apostles didn't lose faith, why should we lose faith? But he, they were voted down, and they couldn't say anything. They couldn't add anything, but they could subtract. So they took out 18 years of his life. But those 18 years were spent in, in, in India, learning from people. He was a master, he was an avatar, but even an avatar has to learn. <clears throat> And he was in Puri, he was in Kashmir, he was in many places. And there is an interesting um, document in um, a monastery in Kashmir, which is a part of Tibet, which documents just that, his visit here to this country. So anyway, Jesus also had trouble. He was a troublemaker in the sense that he insisted on truths. And he was talking to the pundits in the temple in Puri. They go, go on, what is it? Jagadguru, uh, no, what is it? Jagannath, that's right. Jagannath temple. And uh, he was trying to say that caste system is not valid. And uh, people all got angry with him and he just stood his, his guns. 
You know, the true caste system are the four races of man. You, you, the Brahmin, Shudra, Vaishya, Kshatriya. These are all evolutions of man. A, a Kshatriya is not, I mean, a Brahmin is not born into that caste. It says in the Bhagavad Gita that if even the worst of sinners meditates deeply, count him among the good. This means you can change your caste even in one lifetime. Your caste is the consciousness you express. It is not who your father was. And Brahmins decided that they wanted their sons to be Brahmins. And so they hardened that system into a system, but it's not that. You, as a, as a, as a Shudra, you're, you look at uh, some of these Chokidars, they don't do anything, they don't read, they don't use their cell phones much. We just passed one who was using his cell phone, and I was very pleased. But they just sort of sit there. That's Shudra consciousness. They should at least do something while they're sitting there, educate themselves in some way, uh, study something, learn English, whatever it might be. But a Shudra doesn't want to. In the SRF version of the Bhagavad Gita, there is a <clears throat> there is saying there where it says, this is what a shudra can do to evolve higher. Well, Master didn't say that, but the thing is that one of the hallmarks of a shudra is that he doesn't want to advance. He's perfectly happy being doing nothing and being stupid. But then, as his intelligence evolves, he begins to think he has to use this intelligence. That's what separates him from the lower animals. And so he uses it, but he uses it in an egoic way. And so a Shudra is epitomized as a peasant. But there, there, there were many intelligent, educated peasants. It's only an epitomization, uh, if that's the right word. My own language, and I'm not sure. Anyway, the next one, merchants. There are plenty of very generous merchants, noble merchants, but the typical merchant is there thinking, what can I get for me? What's in it for me, Charlie? As Charlotte's Web says. And that kind of merchant consciousness is using your intelligence to feed your ego. After a while in that kind of incarnation, you reach the point where you understand that I was happier when I gave somebody something than I went when I took it. He said, why is that? And he begins to think more, and he evolves up to the Kshatriya level. A Kshatriya is epitomized as a soldier, but a soldier can be many wrong types of people. The ideal soldier is one who is willing to give his life for the, for the welfare and safety of others. That is the true Kshatriya. It doesn't matter if you're an aristocrat or a peasant. You can be a true Kshatriya if you have that mental outlook. And so it's epitomized only as a soldier, but even in ancient India, where it was a very simple society, society was not, divide, not separated into peasants, uh, merchants, soldiers, and Brahmins, beasts. And so we have to understand that it's all where you are in your consciousness. And a Kshatriya gives to other people, but finally he realizes, I can give food and they'll be hungry again. I can give him a job, and he's not satisfied yet. I can give him happiness, and he's happy. So you can give people happiness by giving them things, and they realize they're not happy. And so gradually you come to understand the best thing to give people is God's bliss. And so when you reach that point, you become a Brahmin. And the Brahmins that I have met are rarely true Brahmins. And I've met true Brahmins on all, all the forecasts. It depends on where you are. And your children may be that or may not be that. My father was a scientist. And he was a noble man, yes. But he couldn't understand why I was giving my life to God. But I had no other desire. I couldn't conceive of any other desire. So although I'm an American, I'm a Brahmin. And this is the truth. All there are no blacks and browns and yellows and whites. In fact, if you look at us, we have pink skin, <clears throat> not white. Anyway, your color of your skin doesn't tell your caste or your race. Your true race 
is the caste you belong to. And the person next door to a true Brahmin may be an accountant who has much more in common with accountants from other countries than he does with people of his own country. It all depends on who you are as an individual. And you can grow from that if you get the spiritual teaching to understand. As Krishna said, even the worst of sinners, if he steadfastly meditates on me, quickly comes to me. Now, do you have any other questions? I have her here to translate for me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hello. You. Namaskar, Swamiji. We have heard you say, talk about Yogananda Ji talking about Baba Ji's meeting with Shankaracharya. We've heard you talk about Baba Ji's meeting with Shankaracharya. That's Master a very Sir. interesting story. Can you please tell us something about it? Unfortunately, you have not written anything about it. He says, unfortunately, you haven't written anything about it. Would you tell more about that story? You know, I might write about it in these lessons. That's a good idea. Remind me. <laughs> yeah. Can you please tell us something about it? The story is this, that Babaji was living in Benares at that time. This is many centuries ago. And uh, he, he, uh, there, uh, Shankaracharya was a known astrologer, among other things. And he came to Benares, and a servant of Babaji's went to visit him, and the, but Shankara told him, you will die tonight. And the servant came back all trembling. And Babaji said, go back and tell him it won't happen. And Shankara said, well, if he can overcome this, I will prostrate myself to him as my guru. And the man came, and that night there was a huge lightning storm. Trees were blown over and all sorts of things. Babaji prostrated himself on the body of his servant. And lightning came all around them, but the servant was alive. And the next day, he went to Shankara and said, here I am. So Shankara then went to Babaji and took yoga initiation. That's a story my guru told me. There are many things about Shankaracharya that make me think that my guru was Shankaracharya. He told the story, for example, once, and you can help me on this, that there was a, a doubting disciple and uh, she doubted everything. One time she said, well, but what if I die? He said, all right, then die, and she fell over dead. Now, is that in any Shankaracharya literature? I can't help thinking that it would not appear in a book. And yet my guru told that story. How did he know it? I think he got it from having been that himself. I, he didn't say he was Shankaracharya, but there's a lot that makes me think it. And I have asked psychics and they said yes. So anyway, it's an interesting thought because his work has been to bring back the work of Shankaracharya. You know, when, the, when Buddha came, there was too much karmakand. Hinduism had fallen into just doing ceremonies and then the gods will be pleased and give you a blessing of a child or a wife or a job or victory or something or other. And he said, that's not what religion is all about. So you've got to stop thinking about God and think about you, what you can do. And so he didn't talk about God. It's not that he didn't believe in God. He wanted people to stop thinking he will do it for me. He said, you have to do it. So his followers became atheists, and Buddhists, generally speaking, are atheists. They try to improve themselves without God. And so Shankaracharya had to come in and say that God does exist, but he's not in Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesha, and all those things. He is Satchitananda. And my guru gave a different interpretation to Satchitananda, not only ever-existing, ever-conscious bliss, but he also added ever-new bliss. And to me, that's a very good explanation for 
why God created the universe. Because people say God created the universe to enjoy himself through many, and I think joy? With all these people suffering, finally they get out, but it doesn't seem like a happy explanation. Sri Yukteswar said, we'll leave some questions to be answered when you are one with the divine. Okay, but it still leaves me questioning. And I thought that word ever new explains it. It is the nature of bliss itself to want to express itself. And so bliss wants to create itself in the universe from time to time. And then you also understand the reason for all the suffering. People make mistakes, go wrong, until finally they've understood it. It's like a story in, uh, uh, that I heard in America of somebody who was in boot camp where you go to learn to be a soldier before you go to, go to the battle scene. And this man was picking up paper, pieces of paper off the ground. Well, this isn't it. This isn't it. He kept doing it. Finally, somebody said, this man needs to, psych needs to see the camp psychiatrist. And in the psychiatrist's office, he was picking up papers off the desk. And this isn't it. This isn't it. Finally, the psychiatrist recommended him for a medical discharge. When he received it, he said, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to go through all these different experiences until we finally say, this is it. When we have this bliss, then we know everything. So anyway, more questions. Swamiji, you just mentioned that it takes about five to eight million years to evolve like human being. It takes five to eight million years to evolve. This is what I have read. Human yes. being. Now yeah. we also read that Adam and Eve were just created by God in one instant by his thought by the physical, the cordial body and then immediately the astral body and physical body. So which of them is true? Adam and Eve were created by God basically all at once. You know, uh, I'll have to tell you a story first. <laughs> Yogananda was saying, he said, this the Christian was saying, everything in the Bible is literally true. Yogananda said, you mean even the serpent who spoke to Eve? In, yes, even then, in those days serpents could talk. <laughs> Master took off his hat and he said, I bow to the temple of colossal ignorance I behold before me. But he said that man is a special creation. He's not evolved from the monkey. Darwin was wrong in that. And it's an interesting thing. Darwinian evolution teaches that everything evolves accidentally. There's no reason for it. Why is it that people who have been seen from UFOs all have basically the same form. This human form is not evolved. It's, it came as a higher, man said that man, God, master said that man is made in the image of God literally as well as figuratively. Because you see, with his two legs, his arms apart, his head, he becomes a five-pointed star. In the spiritual eye, the central point of the spiritual eye is a five-pointed star. We came from that five-pointed star. Again, when you have the wise men who came to Jesus in Bethlehem, they saw his star in the east. Well, they saw it, if they saw it in the east, they were going westward. They followed the star to his cradle. But the star was behind them, if you take the Bible literally. They didn't, they didn't see it in the east, they were going westward. What they saw, people have made lots of debate about, was it a comet and so on. It was the star of the spiritual eye. It's a symbolic statement that Jesus was an avatar. He was born from the highest point, from God himself took that form, as all avatars do. The meaning of avatar is very simple, but very uh, important to understand. People nowadays say, and my avatar is a banker, for example. That has nothing to do with it. When you achieve samadhi, first of all, there's sabhikalpa samadhi. That's a temporary state. You go into it, but you still have your ego. And when you come back from that, you come back to ego. If you remember that that is your reality, then you go into nirvikalpa. But if you think of yourself, as I, the infant one, this, 
and you think of it in, as defining who your ego is, then that's your last great test on the path in overcoming ego, realizing that yourself is infinite and imagining that self is this little ego. And so people fall from that state. I have reason to believe I fell from that state. You, many people do. Paul Burton was one, others have been, have reached that state of sabhikalpa and then let that make their ego come in again. If you pass that test, then you go into nirvikalpa. And in nirvikalpa, you still have the memory of past incarnations. So you're a jivan mukta, but you're not a siddha, you're not, a, a, you're not attained moksha. A siddha still remembers his past incarnations, so that he has to remember that he himself, it was God in the form of a pirate, it was God in the form of a businessman, and it was God in the form of a housewife, and all those incarnations, you can go for a long time that way. I said to Master, but if you know you're one with God, can't you just say I'm one with God and, be, and make it and be? He said, yes, you can, but most of them, first of all, you don't care in that state. You're one with him anyway. Many saints use that as an excuse to come back and help other people. But he said also that uh, you can overcome a whole incarnation in one meditation. You can even take on several bodies and evolve all, free yourself from those incarnations in several bodies. In a vision, you can see it all. There are many ways, but when you finally overcome all, uh, even all memories of past delusion, then you become, um, you become a, a siddha, a paramukta, completely free. In that state, most people feel, well, enough of that, and they merge back into God. There are very few who have the desire, this desireless desire, to come back and help others. And those people who do come back, they come back as avatars. An ordinary jivan mukta can free a certain number of people. One who attains moksha and comes back as an avatar can free any number. Krishna was such a man, that's why he could free this whole country if the whole country turned to God. Jesus had that power. Every true avatar, Ramakrishna, had that power. My guru had that power. My guru said, I killed Yogananda long ago. No one dwells in this body now but God. And he said in a poem of his, God's boatman, I will come back, if need be, a trillion times, so long as one stray brother is weeping by the wayside. What a wonderful promise, but you can't help thinking what absolute love they have to come back here. Um, an ordinary person can, I asked Master, how many people, because you know there was one man in Sabzi Mundi who was found in the underground and they were digging with spades and they came upon him and India is full of all sorts of strange stories. Anyway, they brought him back and somehow brought him back to life. And he was talking a form of Sanskrit, so they called a pundit, a learned pundit. And the pundit said, well, he's speaking a very ancient form of, San of Sanskrit. And the man said, what yuga is this? And somebody said, Kali Yuga, that's what they believed then. And he said, well, I'm not interested. And he left his body. But he said, if you, when you're brought back once from that state, you can't keep your body. And uh, you, you have to reincarnate. But he said, if you dig over there, you'll find my murti that I used to worship. And uh, my guru said that it's the Divine Mother who forces such people to come back because they cannot find liberation just for themselves. You have to sa save other people too. So m I asked my master, how many people must it be? He said, at least six. So you have to pass the baton to others. You have to help other people. There was another case like that of three men in Calcutta, but, uh, in Bengal, but I won't tell that one. It's the same truth. So Divine Mother wants you to help other people. And I think that those who are in caves in the Himalayas don't find it so easy. They may be very great. There was one whom people met who were trying to make them 
had them his guru, but they were master's disciples. It was wrong of him. He, he, he wrote me a message saying that Babaji wants you and me to do a particular yagna to save the world. I said, if he wants it, I have other plans and he'll have to tell me so himself. He can, I can't do it just because you've told me. And he didn't tell me. So here I am. But uh, uh, it's a very strange country. It, <laughs> <laughs> you find all sorts of things. I mean, think of the Brigur Sangita. It told me that I have brothers, but no, no sister, no living sister is possible. But one will, be, one will die in his mother's womb. When I got back to America, I asked my mother, did you ever have a miscarriage? She said, yes, one. Uh, he said many things that have come true. He lived 5,000 years ago. How could he know? I, I have had very many extraordinary experiences of that type. There's here in Gurgaon and Agastya, and uh, uh, I don't know. The pundits came to see me because I, had, I couldn't go there. And they insisted first that I go because they said Shiva and Parvati insisted. I said, I can't then in that case. I have a party to go to and I'm leaving Italy for India, India for Italy. And uh, they came over and as soon as they began their reading, suddenly a huge storm blew up and uh, trees were being knocked over and lightning, thunder, rain was so heavy that it, it flooded the streets deep. And uh, as soon as the reading ended, the storm ended. How do you figure things like that out? It's a strange country. <laughs> but I would say, take advantage of it while you're here. Anyway, any other questions? Swamiji, have you ever met Babaji? I have not, but I've had experiences with him. One time I was in Chennai, Madras at that time, <clears throat> and I was due to come back to Calcutta to begin work for our organization, YSS, at that time. And uh, I wanted very much to take seclusion, but they were having a reverse monsoon, and it was very heavy, and I just know where I would, where I could go, and I was in a hotel. So I prayed to Babaji one morning before going down to breakfast. And I said, please help me to find a place of seclusion. And then I went down and the table next to mine in the breakfast room, the man said, you know, I have a house in Kodai Canal and I'm not going to be there for a few days. I would like it if you would come and stay there. Just without any introduction, he didn't know that I wanted a place. But uh, that was one very good answer. I had another one, and another one that a uh, brother disciple of mine had. He um, was a plumber, and he was trying to get a pump working that flowed down from the statue of Jesus Christ down into a lake, and it wouldn't work, and he, it needed priming, and he, didn't know, it didn't, he couldn't make it happen. So he remembered what Master had said, that if you just call to Babaji, he will come to you and he will give an instantaneous answer. And so he prayed to Babaji, suddenly Babaji appeared to him and he went into a state of ecstasy and Babaji talked to him at length and uh, then when he came out of his meditation, the pump was working. Another one was a center leader in Merida, Yucatan in Mexico. And when he first read the autobiography and came to that passage, he said, if this is true, I must know it. And he sat down and called to Babaji. Suddenly, the whole room was filled with light. So I know many stories, but I have not seen anything. It has not been my good karma to see. The only vision I've ever had was a sudden appearance of a large green face. <laughs> 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 anyway. I, I'm envious of anybody who has them, but <laughs> I don't. Anyway, I feel blessed, and that's more important. Any other questions? Yes. Swamiji Pranam. Uh, I am a professor and scientist, and that is the negative point according to spiritualism. He's a professor and, and scientist. Okay. I heard you for the first time 
uh, last week in the uh, DLF City Phase 5 Club. Uh, my question is that uh, I have uh, visited various ashrams in the past 40 years to seek something, maybe to, to have some link with God and to follow a particular path. Invariably, wherever we go and meet these great people and their disciples say, you surrender. Invariably what? People say surrender. He's been to various ashrams to seek help. I call that bilge. They say surrender. I say, if, if, I say if I completely surrender, first of all, why should I? Where? What basis? What basis? I completely and if, agree. And if I surrender, then there is nothing to ask. My heart is with you. I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, why should I surrender to something I don't even know? Yes. And to right. surrender to God? Well, surrender implies somebody at the, with his back to the wall saying, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> surrender should be a joyful gift. It should so be self-giving to God. Is it more surrender. important to have commitment to yourself and follow the path is it more than to completely to have surrender the guru to yourself and follow the path or to completely surrender to the guru no S seek your higher self that which satisfies that higher self i myself i was desperately seeking god i i thought i i didn't know that there were such things as saints and i thought maybe i'm going crazy because I want something nobody's ever done before. I didn't know about that. I thought, am I going crazy? I was so desperate, but I thought, even if I go crazy, I have to seek God. And at that point, God sent me to my guru, and I met him. But uh, it comes as a grace. And I've had several saints in India try to make me their disciples. I can't say they aren't true saints if they do that. You, you have to, God has to take you. You have to surrender yourself first. When, when, you, when you start on the path, you have to make the effort. That's where Buddha was so right in his insistence. We've got to make the effort. But the effort is to open ourselves. You know, this is what the experience that I had. I went out into the dark. It was near Charleston, South Carolina in America. And I was saying I had been seeking truth through science, through political systems, through arts, through everything. And I realized every way is a, is a dead end. And I thought there's got to be an answer. And I finally thought, well, the only people who have really done good in this world are the great figures like Buddha, like Jesus. I didn't know Krishna in those days. I didn't know anything of Indian philosophy, so I didn't think of him. <laughs> But uh, I thought, I went out one night and I said, there has to be a God. But if there is, what must he be like? And I, we couldn't have a form. This universe is too large for any form to do anything. He couldn't be a policeman or a judge waiting for us to make a mistake so he can throw us into hell. He has to be something, something. Finally, I thought, well, why am I asking this question because I'm conscious. It's not something my brain could have been programmed to do. Therefore, he must be consciousness. And I, my consciousness, must be a part of his consciousness. And I realized there had been times in my life, maybe if I'd been drinking, when I was less conscious. There were other, <coughs> other times, maybe when I was especially happy, when I was more conscious. And I realized that the goal of life and the purpose of everything is to open our consciousness to his consciousness. And I thought then the purpose of life is to seek to open my consciousness to his. And therefore, I will give my life to seeking God. And I remember I came back that night to the rooming house and rooming apartment which I shared with four other young men. And they laughed at me for being so serious about everything. I just think, thought, why listen to these yapping puppies? Mm -hmm. And I went to my room. But uh, 
That is the final reality. The trouble with science is that it goes too much by the mind. We have to transcend the mind. Real understanding comes from intuition, from superconsciousness. Science, it's an interesting fact, science changes its mind every 10 years about basic principles of science. Even the most basic belief, Darwinism, now is coming under question. They're always going to be asking questions. There's one class of human being who have always had the same opinion, always spoken the same truth, throughout whatever their country, whatever their culture, whatever age they lived in, they've all said that there is God and our job is to find God. And however they've described God, they've said the ultimate duty of man is to merge himself with God again. The saints have never disagreed. You never find argument among saints. You may find it among priests, not among saints. They all agree. So take it this way. It doesn't matter which path you follow, so long as it's a path inward. That's the main truth. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. There's a lady here for Namaste, Swamiji. My question is how to practically balance humble service and humility on one end with self-respect and uh, egoic self-reference on the other so as to be able to completely banish the ego. Please help me. How to completely banish the ego on the one hand, how to serve and give the other without ego and the other hand to, what was the second part? Said to maintain a self-respect. Maintain self-respect. It's all, it's all realizing that God is doing it through you. You know, in my life, I've written 144 books, some of them quite long. My interpretations of the Gita took only less than two months. My biography of Yogananda took three weeks. My my demystifying Patanjali, which will come out in a few days here in India, took only three weeks. How can I do all that work? I've written over 400 pieces of music. You might think, well, I'm pretty hot stuff. <laughs> the reason I could do it all was that I didn't do it at all. He did it through me. I would ask him, guide me, and I would understand. And if I had a melody, I'd say, I want a melody that says this, this, and this, give it to me. It just came. If you are t in tune with God, you don't have to use your ego. The ego is the greatest obstacle. Feel that God is talking through you or doing things through you. Even if you're cooking or walking down the street, a wonderful meditation is a walking meditation where you feel that God is walking through you. And if a dog barks, think of God is saying something to you through that dog. As you develop that consciousness, you begin to feel that there is really a power in your life. I remember one time in the church in Hollywood, a lady said to me afterwards, she complimented me on my talk. And I said, as I always do and feel, I said, God is the doer. She said, oh, really? <laughs> as if I knew it was good, I didn't know it was that good. That's not what I meant. I meant that he is working through all our egos. Everything you think comes from him. But if you, give, if you understand that it's he doing it, you'll gradually be able to come the, overcome the sense of ego, which is not separate from God. It's only you who tell yourself it's separate from God. So you understand? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Swamiji? Short phrases. Does, does everybody, every individual has an aura? Does and every if individual so, have an aura? And if so, does it increase or decrease according to one's uh, actions? And if so, does it increase or decrease according to one's actions? It increases aura? or dec decreases according to your consciousness, not to your actions. A good man may do something that's difficult that would n maybe normally bring a person's consciousness down, but it will expand. Arjuna had to fight in the battle of Kurukshetra. He had to kill people. But his aura was saintly because he was an avatar. <coughs> Yogananda was Arjuna in that life. And Krishna was Babaji. So there are many mysteries here. But the aura reflects your consciousness. As you have a more giving consciousness, so it becomes more and more pure. 
If you have a lustful consciousness, it will have a downward kind of color. But I have to tell you this, I do not see anything, so I don't see auras. And uh, I would love very much to see, but what am I to do? I have this karma that I have to work out. And uh, I know my guru said to me, these things are being hidden from you. Why? Because I have work to do, but also because I, in past lives, had many doubts. I think having been a great doubter has been a blessing for me in this life, because you couldn't possibly have a doubt that I haven't had. <laughs> it's been my nature to question everything, but in this life I have faith. Anyway, because of that, he says, those things are hidden from you for now. Let it be. Any other questions? Brother, I ask. Swamiji, I'm a surgeon. I'm a heart surgeon. And He's in the a last, heart surgeon. Okay. And in the last 15 years, uh, I have come across very few patients whom I'm operating, and they've said, this is my last life as a human. Just and, a minute, and he's come across many patients? Few, very you, few. That have said, this is my last life as a human. And this has always given a very different feeling when I've operated on them and they've walked back. So what is the interpretation of them saying this? This has given a different feeling when you operate, when he operated on them and they came. And what is the interpretation of them saying this to me? What is the interpretation of them saying that to him that this is may be their last life? As a human. As a human. Well, I hope they don't mean the next life they're going to be a cobra. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have to be in this book on reincarnation. I've read quite a few past life memories and so on. All very interesting. The, hip, the people who regress you by hypnosis, I'm not sure I trust many of them. They le ask leading questions. I think Brian Weiss seems pretty reliable. Most of them, I don't think, are. Newton, I think he's, he misleads people by his questions. Anyway, what they must mean is that somehow they have, because one mistake they all make is that people say they have to come back to finish their duty. What duty do we have? We have only one duty, to find God, to free ourselves of desires. When you have no more desire, you won't come back here. Desire is a form of energy, and when that energy goes outward and takes uh, and visualizes cigarettes, they don't have cigarettes in the astral world. You'll have to come back here to satisfy that desire. If you want a car, then you'll have to come back here to, find car, to get a car. But if you don't have any desire for anything in this world, then you know you're free. So do these people who tell you these things, are they free of desire? If so, they'll be free, because all of us have to be free sooner or later. Do they tell you that? Uh, no, they don't say anything, but they've always given a very spiritualistic feeling when I'm operating on them. They give a spiritual feeling when he's operating on them. Well, they may be. They may be. It's every one of us in this room and everybody in the streets of Delhi and everybody on this planet has to reach that point. Meanwhile, however, they can go down as well as up because free will gives you the chance to go in either direction. And you can fall as far as the level of a germ. And it takes, just think of the pain, realizing that you should be something more and yet being in that form and evolving all the way up. But uh, it's a long thing. When you finally overcome that, it's so simple. Why should I want anything of this world? And I believe that it's very possible that these people were right in saying that. I hope it's possible. I hope it's true. And India is a spiritual country. India really, I, what, one of the missions that I have in India is to help Indians to understand that India is the guru of the world. India right now, when I was here in the late 50s, 60s, there were many saints. Now I have yet to meet one. I'm sad about that, but I know um, Abdul Kalam, I met him, and he asked me, what do you think about the changes in India? I said, well, they're necessary. India has to claim her part as one of the great nations of the world. But I don't think India can get away from 
her spirituality. It's in the soil. And I think that now already it's starting to come back to that. And uh, its destiny in time is to help others. So you must realize that your role is not just to become a wealthy nation. Your role is to help guide the whole world to the understanding that the only solution in life is loving God. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. In the back, Susha. Uh, humble pronouns to you, Swamiji. There's a question that I have. I think many of us here in this room, we are married and in typical Indian families. Many people here are married and in typical Indian families. And uh, it's said that uh, marriage itself is a big karmic connection. And uh, you know, the families that we belong to are the ones who are typically very much into materialism and... The families they belong to are typically into materialism. And since we came onto this path and we are spending more time on meditation, they can tend to feel that we are moving away from them and that's disturbing them. So the family, since they're into meditation and on this path, it disturbs their family members. It does. It does. You always, if you start seeking God, you'll get persecution, and especially from your family. There is a saint in South India called Sada Shiv, and he was in the family and meditating. And one day he found a great commotion in the house, and he said, what's going on? And he said, your bride-to-be is coming. He thought, if my bride's coming, their mere coming can create such turmoil. <laughs> What will my life be after she comes? <laughs> so he left the house and never turned back. <laughs> well, I'm not telling you all to become sadhus, but I am saying that if you want God, you've got to be firm in yourself. Otherwise, what have you got? You've got children, they get children, they get children, and it goes on forever. And in your next life, you'll find God, but instead you have another child. And it goes on. <laughs> Marriage can be a great curse if it's understood in the wrong way. It should be to balance male and female energies. In that way, it can be a great blessing. But because people make it worldly, it is often a curse. And I know there's a story, a joke that I read, that uh, my wife and I were very happy for 20 years, and then we met. <laughs> and another one, somebody asked, how is it that your wife and, and you were having such harmony? She said, well, we go out every night, twice a week, to dine, dinner, candlelight, soft music. I go out Tuesdays, she goes, she goes out Fridays. <laughs> and a third one, my wife's an angel. Oh, you're lucky, mine's still living. <laughs> <laughs> so, Swamiji, you have to be strong in yourself. But how do you we manage? To, huh? How do we balance the two? That becomes very confusing. How do you balance the two between your, your spiritual life and your life with your family? <laughs> <laughs> how am I going to answer that? I left my family. <clears throat> I still have a brother who just, it's impossible to be with him. Um, I can't answer it, sorry. And we will now sing the school song. <laughs> Why don't you go out and sing? We'll have some music. <laughs> the singers. They're going to sing. Yeah, move this. Can I think I'm up yes, you can come up with the case. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
song and it came out this way that's what I mean God is doing it not me <laughs> Thank you very much. That was beautiful. It's a very moving song. 
You know, I wanted to say one thing more. What I hope that we can do in India, <clears throat> I have started a new Naya Swami order, and it includes <clears throat> householders. Its purpose is to let everybody who really wants to live for God, to do it wherever he is. People can first be Tyagis and then Naya Swamis. I am a Swami, but I'm also a Naya Swami. Yeah, it's easier to say Swami, but uh, Naya Swami is what I really am now. And that's why we have this costume blue, which indicates the in infinity of the skies and all. The Naya Swami is one who follows the system of rules that I have written in a book on renunciation. But I would like to see this consciousness spread all over India and this new order spread all of India because I feel India is ready for it. I have met too many Swamis who are not true Swamis. I would like this freedom to um, give people the feeling they can be this themselves. Let me stand up with you all now. And I would like to pray for all of you and send you blessings in Om. God bless you all.